It is my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Yun Hao Tang from uh, Google DeepMind in London at our seminar. Uh, Dr. Tang uh, previously before joining DeepMind was a PhD student at Columbia University in New York and his research interests lie in uh, theoretical and empirical aspects of deep reinforcement learning. And today's topic is perfectly within the scope and we will see uh, how self-predictive representation learning works when applied to reinforcement learning. So how very welcome here at TI AI seminar and the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Maxim. Thanks a lot for um, for the invitation to the seminar as well. Um, Yes, as introduced, I'm Yung Hao. I'm a, currently a research scientist at DeepMind based in London. And today I'm going to discuss with you um, this recent paper we have uh, called Understanding Self-Predictive Representation Learning for RL. Yes. So before diving into the details of, um, of what I'm going to discuss, I want to give a very quick summary of the structure of the talk. Um, I want to start with uh, pretty slowly on some background on reinforcement learning, setting up some notations, as I'm sure that some of the audience are already familiar with the notations, but just to set up the stage for the discussion. Um, and also, then I will discuss representation learning for reinforcement learning. Uh, these first two parts are mainly uh, meant to set up the like a background stage for discussion. Uh, I'll try to go slowly and interactive uh, in this stage. If you have any questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, and then I will discuss this self-predictive approach for learning representation for reinforcement learning. And then we'll dive into the uh, some of the uh, key insights that we have in the paper. Right. So the first part is uh, some quick background on reinforcement learning. So just to give a motivation, I guess reinforcement learning is uh, uh, very relevant to the development of cutting edge AI systems uh, these days. From a couple of years ago, we already have success from AlphaGo and video playing, uh, all based on reinforcement learning systems. So to set up a stage for the RL framework, we have the uh, environment and we have an agent. Uh, the agent takes action in the environment and the environment gives back uh, observations or state at each time step, as well as the reward function. And so uh, just to make things a little bit more formal, let's consider the Markov decision process where at each time step, the environment would sample the uh, next state according to a transition dynamic and a reward function according to the current state X and the action taken by the agent. And here the missing element is the action uh, taken by the agent according to some policy pi. Throughout the talk, we will fix this policy pi. So we basically will fix the, the strategy based on which the agent takes the action. So this is just meant to make the whole discussion a lot simpler. In practice, if you want to optimize to play the game, you need to change the policy, you want to optimize it. But for now, let's say we just fix the policy pi and our agent takes action AT from a fixed policy pi condition on the current state XT and the environment sample next state and the reward function. And the whole thing rolls forward like this. And now let us uh, make things a little bit simpler. Uh, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to try to remove the action from the discussion. So as we saw just now, in general, we have action taken by the agent and the environment transition to a next state according to a transition dynamics, the reward function sampled from the environment as well. But now I'm just going to uh, fold the action as part of the transition as well. So in other words, we're only going to consider the sequence of states generated by the, uh, by the in interaction. So we can think of the next state xt plus one as being generated from the previous state xt from some transition kernel p pi. So you can think of the sequence of state xt that we encounter along a trajectory as basically a Markov chain that follows from some uh, transition kernel p pi. Here, a p depends on pi because we're fixing the policy. This is just to kind of denote the dependency of the transition on the policy. And 
just to set up the um, the dimension of PPI a little bit. So we always consider a finite state space for simplicity. So this absolute curly X refers to the size of the state space. For example, it can be 10, 20, or in practice, it can be quite a lot. Um, and this PPI can be thought of as a matrix, as basically a Markov matrix uh, from which we sample next state condition on the current state. Yes, yeah, so uh, very important quantity of interest in the decision-making uh, problem is the notion of value function. So the value function basically measure the long-term cumulative uh, reward over time. So as you can see here, it's defined as the cumulative sum of reward condition on the initial state, and we define it and we take the expectation over both the policy and the randomness in the transition dynamic. And this gives us a scalar value function at each state. Uh, so the value function would measure the long-term performance of the policy over time. And in matrix form, we can write the value function in a more, uh, uh, in, in a kind of a matrix format. So because value function is defined per state, we can think of the value function v pi itself as being a vector of size, the number of states. And we can basically express it as uh, having two parts. One part is the immediate reward, and another part is the uh, is this uh, inverse of the uh, I minus gamma p pi matrix. So p pi is uh, the transition matrix. As you can see here, the R pi corresponds to the immediate reward, whereas the first part, which is the inverse of the transition matrix, corresponds to the transition dynamics of the of the MDP. So intuitively, the V pi is being calculated as a cumulative uh, sum of reward. And in here, it's being reflected in this matrix format here. So by multiplying the immediate reward by this inverse matrix, we accumulate the reward over time and calculate the value function. All right, so this is just to set up a quick stage for, uh, for the reinforcement learning setting. Now I'm going to discuss a bit about the representations, representation learning as well as just representations for reinforcement learning. Uh, so I want to start with a reminder from a supervised learning setting. Um, for any of us who has uh, studied, you know, re read this classic literature on supervised learning, regression, classification, we're pretty much uh, familiar with these kind of images. So let's say we have a classification task where we have the red dots and blue dots corresponding to two classes of data points we try to classify. The XIs are the raw data points, and YIs are, for example, the binary uh, labels in this case. And as you can see here, if we start with the original classification task, the decision boundary for doing the classification is quite nonlinear because um, the red dots are kind of embedded inside the blue dots. And in, at this point, we might come up with some uh, kind of uh, representation function, which I define to be mapping from the original data space to a k-dimension, uh, k-dimensional Euclidean uh, space. So notice here that uh, in, in this setting, the curly x, the, the space for the original data point, can be just the k-dimensional k Euclidean space as well. Um, basically, this is a mapping a feature map or representation map that map from the original data point to a new uh, feature space. And with this new set of feature, uh, phi of xi for each data point, as well as the yi, we can rethink about the classification problem again. And all of a sudden, we see that this task has become much easier because the decision boundary can be made linear in this case. Of course, in this particular case, all we need to do is to do some kind of a polar to Cartesian coordinate transformation. But in general, this needs to be a little bit more complicated. But the main idea here is that if you pick the right representation, the downstream problem becomes uh, much easier to solve. So just to recap a little bit, we typically have some supervised learning tasks where we have xi as the raw data points and y as either the binary label or some regression targets we want to predict. And given the representation, um, phi of xi, probably we want to derive some uh, linear, uh, uh, we have some linear classification classifier or linear predictor on top. The w is the linear weights of this classifier or the predictor, and we can predict the corresponding yi targets pretty easily. 
in the previous case, that would be to trans transform the data from the like the embedded space into more of a linear decision boundary, and we can design a W in that case. So what will be the what will be the corresponding setup for reinforcement learning? So one way to think of it is uh, we can think of reinforcement learning prediction as being very similar to the supervised learning case. You just need to replace the yi by the value function xi, because typically uh, we're interested in uh, predicting the long-term cumulative performance of the agent. That is to say, we predict the value function, um, and in this case, this, the xi is not arbitrary input anymore. It will be the raw state or the raw observation that we take from the environment. And uh, the v pi of xi will be the value function for that state. So notice that the v pi xi, uh, let, let's assume for now the v pi xi is something that we know is like is like a regression target we want to feed against. Um, and in, in this setting, we would uh, have a very similar case as a supervised uh, learning task where we just want to find a representation for the corresponding state xi, so phi of xi, such that we can just have a linear weight on top and make a good prediction against the value function. So it's just one way of thinking about the representation learning problem in RL. And then the question is, um, can we characterize good representations for RL? So Notice that we were we can formulate this whole prediction problem as minimizing some kind of L2 loss. So here, starting from Xi, we have a Vi as the value function target. We want to minimize uh, this value function target with respect to the linear weight that we have. But notice that this whole objective is a function of the representation Phi. So you can imagine if you have a very good representation, then this whole value uh, if you minimize W on top of a good representation, then this error can be pretty small. Whereas if you have a very bad representation, then this error is kind of irreducibly large because you don't capture enough information um, to make good prediction. So as a uh, as an example, uh, as an example representation, typically in RL we start by assuming that the state are represented as one hot vector. So you recall that we have like absolute number number of states. So each state xi can be represented as a one hot indicator um, in this case by default. So it's a pretty long uh, vector. It's like an x dimensional vector, but it's very sparse, only one for the state that we want to represent. So this representation, uh, if we take xi itself as a representation, this is pretty, uh, pretty bad in some cases because we're basically treating each state independently. So state one and state two are represented as two one hots, and they don't share uh, much similarities. What we really would like is if two states are similar, then we want to make their representations similar as well. So as a very naive example, if v, the value function for state i and state j are similar, we would also want the representations for these two, two states to be similar as well, uh, because that will allow us to uh, generalize the prediction better. Um, because in this case, let's say we already fit the value function for state i pretty good, then since the, since the representations for those two states are similar, this can generalize pretty well to the prediction of state j as well. Whereas in the old one-hot representation learning, uh, one-hot representation case, these two uh, values need to be predicted pretty much independently. And that would be much more undesirable. Um, because we don't share any information up from uh, between the states. So how do we derive a good representation for uh, reinforcement learning? One way of doing this is, at least conceptually, we can carry out spectral decomposition of the transition matrix. So recall that uh, p pi is a state by state kind of squared matrix. Let's say in this case, just for uh, an example, we can do a spectral decomposition. So in this case, I'm plotting here the SVD singular value decomposition of the transition matrix. So this gets decomposed into a low rank matrix. Uh, multiply has three components. First component is a state by K uh, matrix and then a K by K matrix and then K by uh, state matrix. So K here is a number that we choose. Uh, we can, when we choose K to be pretty small, that means we take only the top K 
uh, singular vectors of the of the decomposition. This means the this means the the decomposition is more uh, is pretty much pretty approximate because we threw away a lot of the high order uh, singular vectors. But when k is large, we can uh, we can recover more and more uh, singular uh, vector components. But in, but the good uh, the advantage for having a small k is that in this case the representation will be much more uh, pr uh, succinct. In this case, it's a more compact representation if k is a much smaller number than the uh, capital X. So one way of defining the representation is that if we look at the left singular uh, component of the uh, of the uh, transition matrix, and then you, as you can see here, it's a state by k uh, matrix. And if we index the ith state xi, we can we can see here the row vector is of dimension k. We can directly take this uh, row row vector of dimension k as the representation for state xi. So this pretty it gives a pretty good representation because of the fact that it's uh, kind of capturing the top k uh, left singular vector of the transition matrix. We can intuitively think of it as characterizing some kind of a principal transition components um, in the transition structure. So this representation would, uh, would capture the information of the original transition matrix pretty well, although it has a k own k dimension, which is much smaller than the dimension of the uh, original uh, state space. Uh, so this is so if you don't get some of the details, I think I gloss over many details, for example, justify why the representation here, why the left singular vector is good, not the right singular vector and so on. Um, but just for the purpose of understanding the rest of the talk, all you need to uh, grab at this moment is that doing a singular vector decomposition or a PCA, some kind of spectral decomposition on the transition matrix allows you to capture uh, the structure of the transition matrix in a pretty compact way. So that is pretty good representation uh, in practice. And there are theoretical justifications for this as well. And finally, just want to um, quickly mention, there are obviously two ways of looking at the representation. There's an old way in which the representations are handcrafted. So we just fix uh, the representation. In the supervised learning case, uh, for example, if you remember the two kind of the classification tasks, we typically carry out one transformation and fix the transformation. And on top of the fixed representation, we carry out the downstream uh, classification or prediction task. So the representation is fixed throughout learning. Uh, whereas in, I mean, in the recent decades, typically we learn the representations learn to or end to end. So as an example in RL, we start with a uh, image of the game that we're trying to play. So this image can be thought of as a state xi. And on top of that, we uh, we have a convolutional neural network. And on top of the embedding from the convolutional neural network, we have a multilayer perceptron that eventually predict the value function uh, for the state. So we can think of the output from the convnet uh, as the representation and the MLP on top as the, the w, the linear weight that we learn. So these kind of... Um, how do you say bisection is a little bit arbitrary, but this is meant to say that the ballpark of the network gives you a representation. And on top of that, you fit with a relatively smaller network, in this case, just a multilayer perceptron to feed the value function. And this whole system, the comnet uh, combined with the MLP are learned end to end with some kind of loss function. Can be Q-learning loss, policy grading loss, or some other auxiliary loss, but the whole uh, representation is learned end to end. So this offers some flexibility on top of the original handcrafted representations because we allow the uh, low level representations to evolve over time, adapting to the task that we are interested in. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, dive into some details of self-predictive learning for reinforcement learning. So the idea of uh, self-predictive re uh, reinforcement uh, representation learning is very, very simple. So, um, so the idea here is the following. Uh, we start with, as you can see here, if we're playing some video game, we have state X and the Markov chain transition to a next state Y. It's transitioning ac according to this uh, PPI uh, transition matrix. 
Okay, but the st uh, but the state space for X and Y can be very large. So in, in this particular case, the video game, the state space can be um, astronomical because we have so many pixels. Uh, so we want the representation to be able to capture uh, useful information about the state, about the transition, but in a more compact way. So the representation phi of X and phi of Y here are both k-dimensional, much lower dimensional uh, vectors. And it is, it is also reasonable to think that there is a transition, there is a Markov chain in the original state space, and there should be also some kind of uh, transition dynamics in the latent space. So if we embed the X and Y into latent space, we should also expect to have some kind of uh, approximate transition dynamics in a, in a latent, uh, in latent space. So um, one way to think about it is we can think of the phi of X and phi of Y as uh, so in this, for example, in this particular video game case, uh, the original spa state space X and Y can contain many pixels and sometimes contain pixels which are irrelevant to the task at hand. Uh, for example, uh, these like uh, these like black and a little bit of a, or like gray areas on the side, probably they're they're not going to change at all throughout learning and they're not very important for for us in order to solve the task. So, but the X and Y all contain this information, but phi of X and phi of Y can throw away uh, these uh, irrelevant information. Uh, maybe phi of X and phi of Y would only record the position of the pad here as well as the position of the, of the flying ball here. And the latent dynamics P would only be responsible for modeling the, the much lower dimensional uh, movement of the pad and of the, of the ball over time. Um, so as you can imagine here, there when you have a latent uh, representation here, uh, there should be a, a transition dynamics in the latent space that can kind of model these high level transition accordingly. So uh, the question is, how do we learn the phi of x and p and phi of y? How do we learn the representation and latent transition? So one way to think about this is to minimize the uh, Rep the prediction loss uh, in the latent space, in the representation space. So the idea here is if we start with the representation uh, phi of x, and if we do a latent transition on top, so here I'm writing latent transition as a matrix multiplication, um, because if you think of the phi of x as a k-dimensional vector, the p matrix here can be thought of as a k-by-k k, uh, matrix. And when you do one step transition forward, you're going to arrive at uh, the next state. And in latent space, when you do one step transition in the um, in the latent space, you should arrive at the representation at the next state. So basically this is to enforce some kind of a self-consistency uh, between the representation and latent dynamics. So that you sh when you expect Y to be the next state of X, you should expect phi of y to be the next representation state of phi of x when you undergo this uh, transition in a latent space. And um, just a, a quick mention of the fact that uh, this objective is actually being used in practice um, uh, quite a lot with some caveats that we will discuss later. So in practice, um, instead of doing uh, for example, in our case, we have to linearize everything. We have to analyze everything as matrix multiplication. But in practice, the phi of x can be a convenient, convolutional neural network or ResNet. And P here, the latent transition can be carried out by a LSTM or a transformer. So then the key question remains is, uh, can we prove what kind of representations we're learning if we uh, minimize uh, this objective? If you follow this high-level uh, high intuition of uh, predicting the representation in latent space. Uh, before diving into that, I want to have a very quick, quick look at some of the architecture that realizes this. For example, this is uh, the architecture plot for, uh, for a paper that uses this algorithm. Uh, we can think of these images as X and Y, and there is a bunch of encoding uh, at the beginning. So you can think of the encode long online encoder here as giving you the representation phi, phi of x and phi of y of the corresponding state. And the second part will corresponds to these latent transition dynamics that corresponds to the 
uh, uh, that, that is typically implemented as an LSTM. And finally, on the right, you have some loss function. In our case, we analyzed the L2 loss, but in practice, it's more common to use cosine similarity loss. But the high level, uh, high level correspondence between the mathematical model and these practical implementations uh, should be pretty clear here. Yeah, so I hope that I've convinced you that it is indeed a pretty simple idea. It's like there is no uh, more complicated thought or motivation behind, uh, behind this predicting uh, latent state from your latent current state and with a modeled latent dynamics. I hope I have convinced you that this is a pretty uh, simple idea indeed. Um, but the issue with this is that if you just look at the loss function we constructed, which was pretty intuitive, the minimizer to this loss function is pretty bad. You can see that one of the minimizer is just to set all the representations to be zero or any constant vector and, and P to be identity in that case. Um, or in the case where the representation is zero, then the, the, we have already achieved a uh, minimal uh, objective of this prediction loss. But the thing is, these kind of representations are useless because they're, they're collapsed representations. They collapse all the states, no matter how different they are, to the same representation. And this is obviously not desirable because we're not able to perform any meaningful downstream tasks at all on top of this kind of collapsed representation. So what is going on, uh, what is going on here? This is, it seems to be an idea that works pretty well in practice, but the theoretical motivation behind this becomes pretty unclear if you look at the global minimizer of the uh, loss function. Yeah, so that's what brings uh, us to the last section, which is to try to understand the myth. Um, so the, the key high level insight um, of our work is basically to say that looking at the loss function itself is not enough. Uh, what's important is you have to look at how you minimize the loss. So the learning dynamics um, can make a very big difference here. Although we argue that there is, there are many collapsed representations which are useless, but the learning dynamics may not take us to those representations. So if we are being careful with how we optimize this objective, we might end up uh, not having these uh, collapsed representations. So one key point of, uh, of carefully implementing optimization process is to, um, is to carry out something we call the stop gradient or semi-gradient descent. So a typical way of optimizing the, the original square loss objective is to run gradient descent on both P and phi, on both the latent dynamics P and the, and the latent representation phi. Um, but a key uh, algorithmic um, detail here is to put a stop gradient on the phi of y, basically on the prediction target uh, when you when you derive the gradients. So if you, for example, implement this whole thing in TensorFlow or in um, PyTorch or in JAX, you have to put a stop gradient on the backup target. And as a result, your gradient descent is no longer a gradient descent, it becomes a semi-gradient descent. Uh, this stop gradient uh, seems to be pretty important in practice. And it was kind of partially inspired by this kind of a TD learning type of update. So in RL, the TD learning basically carries out a similar type of update. You want to minimize the value prediction, but you put a stop gradient on the backup target. So we'll later see the impact of putting a stop gradient here. And just to uh, simplify the notation a little bit, in the rest of the presentation, I would just write the L2 loss as L of phi mp. So it's a function of phi mp. Uh, but also notice that we always remember to put a stop gradient on the backup target phi of y here. So when you take the gradient on L, it's not exactly a gradient. It's going to be a semi-gradient. Right, so um, then we just implement the uh, update as we would expect. So we just take the gradient or rather the semi-gradient on the loss function L for both the representation phi and the latent transition dynamics p. And t here corresponds to the iteration uh, that we uh, that would perform the updates. Uh, so a key point here is uh, in our analysis, we 
we kind of need P to be updated at a faster pace than the representation. So we need the latent dynamics to be optimized at a faster pace uh, compared to the uh, representation. So this is just to make sure that it's easier to derive uh, theoretical insights from the analysis. So one way to think of, so here we basically need to set P of the next uh, uh, transition matrix as the argument of L of fixing the representation, we're minimizing the latent dynamics part uh, exactly. So one way of thinking about this in practice is that we can put a learning rate um, on, uh, for the sigma gradient uh, update on the latent dynamics matrix here. So if the learning rate is much higher, then basically we're updating the uh, P matrix at a much faster pace compared to the, the representation matrix. Hope things are, uh, the setup are, are relatively clear at this point. All right, so um, the one word summary of what we have been doing in the paper is we basically analyze the dynamics of the learning system, but the original system was a discrete system. So it's much more difficult to analyze the discrete system precisely. So we instead analyze the continuous time system. So the continuous time system, we can think of phi of t and p of t as uh, their, their evolution over time as being governed by uh, a system of ODEs, ordinary differential equations. So the time derivative of phi of t will be following the semi gradient uh, dynamics and the dynamics of the uh, transition matrix p of t would follow these um, kind of more exact updates. So at each time t, when we fix the representation, we assume that the uh, transition matrix, latent transition matrix is adapted optimally at each time step. Um, so as you can see here, the ODE systems that we have here is just a continuous time uh, rewriting of the discrete system we have from the previous slide. And just to quickly mention about the dimension of the parameters that we have here, so we always assume that the representation matrix is a X by K uh, matrix. So because we have X number of states, for each state, we have a K dimensional representation for that state. So if you want to index the representation for state I, just look at the ith row for that matrix. And, and we want to characterize how this representation uh, matrix evolves over time. And P here is just a K by K uh, regular matrix that model the latent dynamics. So the big challenge with analyzing the ODE is, is that it's a very nonlinear set of ODEs. And as a result, we cannot expect to obtain analytic solution from the ODE system. So we need to apply some, um, some more, uh, some slightly more clever way of analyzing the behavior of the ODE. So the whole paper is about trying to understand, trying to come up with some uh, good ways of understanding the behavior of this kind of nonlinear OD. Uh, so the first key result that we have is to basically show that the representation can never collapse under the ODE dynamics. So the key result, which is in the theorem one of the paper, is to show that the covariance matrix of the representation is constant over time. So here, as you can see, this is for arbitrary time t, the covariance matrix uh, at time t is the same as the covariance matrix at time zero, at initialization. And here's a typo, it should be like a k by k matrix because the uh, this should be a squared matrix instead of a vector. So let's think about the uh, special case. If we initialize the representation uh, matrix, so we see it's a x by k uh, matrix. If we initialize the matrix to be uh, orthonormal, uh, so basically we can think of the k columns of the matrices as being orthogonal to each other, and let's say they're also normalized to be of norm one. Um, the, this means that the initial of covariance matrix is identity. And what the theorem one here means is we can expect the, for the rest of the trajectory, the representation matrix also has the identity covariance matrix. So what does it mean visually? is that we can think of the initial uh, representation matrix as being initialized as an orthogonal um, Cartesian coordinate system. 
And any time t in the future, the 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 representation are, are going to stay orthogonal and are orthonormal with respect to each other. So we can think of this as basically a rotating our uh, Cartesian coordinate system. So these representations, uh, if you think uh, think of them visually uh, in the space, they just keep rotating as the ODE rolls forward. Um, and as a result, it can never collapse. So you can never expect the situation where you initialize the uh, representation to be a uh, orthogonal system. And at the end of the day, at some time t, all of the representations collapse to a single direction or collapse to a vector of zeros or a vector of constant. This is impossible because uh, as we see here, the ODE dynamics uh, dictate that the representations can only rotate over time. So they can never change the angles uh, relative to each other. And as a result, they cannot collapse to the same direction. So it is good that we obtain the result of non-collapse. So that means that we cannot uh, come across the situation where all the representations collapse to a single direction and hence the representation becomes uh, useless. Uh, but we still uh, have not resolved the question of what representations do we learn? So in, I guess in principle, it is possible that the representation just keep rotating in the space without, without going anywhere. Uh, so that would also be not ideal. So in a situation, let's first look at a very special case where the transition matrix is symmetric. So in this case, we can show that this objective uh, in the middle here uh, is a non-decreasing objective, or rather it's kind of increasing over time as long as the, the representation phi of t is not at a critical point. So as long as the gradient for phi t, semi gradient for phi t is non-zero, this objective keeps increasing over time. So this objective looks a little bit complicated, but we can think of it as, it's basically a scalar objective and it's a function of phi t. And as a result, it's a function of time. So here we're taking a matrix trace of the multiplication of these two matrices. Um, so it, it looks a little bit uh, complicated, but uh, if you're familiar with the, the, the way we write down the PCA objective, then you can see some very uh, familiar formula here. So basically what happens is here is under the orthogonal constraints, that is, if we assume that the argument to this trace objective is a set of k orthogonal vectors, then the maximizer of this objective will be the top, top k eigenvectors of the transition matrix p pi. Um, so that is to say, um, if you remember, like maybe if many slides ago, we were saying that if we look at the spectral decomposition of the transition matrix, then we can think of these singular vectors as pretty good representations uh, for the RL problem. Then, and here we have the optimization task that says, uh, if you can maximize this objective under the constraints that these representations are orthogonal to each other, then we can uh, maximize it at the top K eigenvectors. This means that it is good to maximize this objective if we can enforce the constraints. Basically, we enforce all these representations to go in different directions, and we maximize this objective. This gives us the top K eigenvectors of the transition matrix, which turn out to be uh, good representations. Um, and if we put together uh, all the two key results that we have so far, uh, we can show that we can show the following result. So recall that the non-collapse property says that the covariance matrix is fixed over time. So let's say we consider the special case if we initialize the covariance matrix to be identity. That is, we have a set of orthogonal representations at the very beginning of the uh, training. Um, and then this non-collapse property says that we basically have the same identity uh, covariance matrix for the rest of the trajectory. And our second result shows that the trace objective is being uh, non-decreasing, uh, being kind of locally maximizing over time. So this means that our ODE dynamics basically carries out a type of gradient descent, a gradient ascent on this trace objective. So visually speaking, we can think of the original representation as these, uh, as the orthogonal Cartesian system, and it keeps rotating over time. And we try to get closer and closer to the top K eigenvectors of the transition matrix as we evolve forward, because um, 
if we can because we're keeping uh, we're we keep maximizing this trace objective, and at maximum value, it will correspond to the top k eigenvectors. So as we can see here, the representation dynamics is such that they keep getting closer and closer uh, to the top k eigenvectors of the transition matrix by maximizing the trace objective over time. Uh, yeah, and this is just to summarize. Um, uh, the results we have so far is that the self-predictive learning dynamics is such that um, this set of ODEs have a set of very nice properties. First is that they can never collapse because of the fixed covariance matrix of the ODE system. And also they maximize the trace objective, which corresponds to doing spectral decomposition of the uh, transition matrix. So that is to kind of justify uh, this kind of self-predictive learning dynamics is doing something meaningful. It's doing a gradient-based SVD or PCA on the on the transition matrix, and hence is able to learn good representation at the end. Yun uh, uh, may, may I have a question on that? Yeah, yes. So uh, these properties are exactly under this uh, under this. Um, requirements that we do optimization with this stop gradient term, right? Yes, yes, that is right. Uh, so we have two key properties here, a key, two key requirements. First, first is the stop gradient, uh, and the second is the uh, transition matrix is optimized at a faster pace compared to the uh, representation matrix. But this faster pace, it uh, how it influences the properties uh, b below. So it's I, I, I'm a bit like missing the link uh, the, because the properties below they look like very fundamental. So how pace uh, influences here? Yes. If you may comment. Yeah, 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 definitely. So that's a very good question. So um, so the re re result is as follows. Um, so the original result is if you have the stop gradient and if you have PT being optimized like at a faster pace, then you can get this exact uh, fixed covariance matrix property. Um, so what happens if you don't put, uh, if you don't have a um, arc mean exactly here, rather, for example, you also let P to be optimized, but not exactly. For example, PT is also following the gradient descent maybe higher learning rate, but it's not optimized exactly, then you don't have this exact property. Although how fast you, how fast this covariance matrix deviates from the initial covariance matrix depends on uh, the suboptimality of, uh, of your optimization here. So if you, if you optimize it perfectly, you can, inf you, you can have this exact equality for all time. If your PT is adapted very slowly, then uh, this will not hold exactly. But how how bad it is in practice will depend on the nature of the transition matrix as well. Okay, great. Does that make sense? No, I think, I think I now I understand that. Thank you. I will also have a question in the chat. Uh, where is the stop gradient in the last maximization ob objective? In the yeah, last, so probably no stop gradient, I would assume. Uh, that's a good point too. Uh, so you're referring to this optimization objective. Do we put a stop gradient here, right? Um, so the thing here is that it does not matter. So we can also either we can either put a stop gradient in L or not, because uh, as you can see here, if you look at the original objective L, uh, the part on which we put the stop gradient does not depend on P. So for P. Uh, as far as P is concerned, the only component that influences the objective is the first component. So whether you put a stop gradient or not does not impact the optimization of P. Yeah, I hope that clarifies. Yeah, that was a question from a chat. Yeah, I think it's yes. clarified. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so yeah, um, some caveats. So we have made some assumptions for discussions. So it does not come for free. For example, we assume symmetricity of the transition matrix. Um, 
on a high level, the, the main reason for this is you can think of it as the arguments that we made just now was basically saying that we're doing PCA on the gradient-based PCA on the transition matrix. But the PCA only makes sense if the covariance matrix is symmetric. And the covariance matrix in our case is the transition matrix. So that's why we need to assume the transition matrix is symmetric. So if it is non-symmetric, empirically, uh, we can still show that uh, the trace objective is still being improved uh, across training, though the improvement would not necessarily be monotonic. So you can definitely design asymmetric MDPs, which are more adversarial to the algorithm that we have. That is, it would uh, the trace objective would oscillate, for example, and it would not necessarily improve. Although if you randomly generate uh, asymmetric matrices, the objective generally gets improved, but it can oscillate from time to time. Um, but the tabular experiments were wrong. The conclusion is basically, if you randomly generate asymmetric matrices, you can expect the final objective that you get is better than the objective at initialization. Although the improvement itself would not, not necessarily be monotonic, and it will be, it, it's also a little bit more difficult to characterize the dynamics in that case. And fu more fundamentally, the issue is that we're using one representation for both the backup target and the prediction. So that's why we come up with the PCA argument because of the symmetricity in the backup target and the prediction target. Uh, to remove this symmetric assumption more fundamentally, we need to modify the algorithm a little bit. So instead of, so that we can move from PCA to a more of a SVD argument on the transition matrix. And that would involve having two representations, one backward representation and one forward representations. Um, yeah, I didn't really have too many details on the slides here. So if you're interested, um, please feel free to refer to the paper or we can uh, discuss it after the, the presentation is finished. Um, yeah, and finally, just want to quickly mention uh, we have some empirical validation on large scale RO problems. So, this is like DM Lab 30 uh, uh, environment in which uh, basically have an uh, agent that navigates these 3D mazes and with visual inputs. So, the agents can navigate these mazes and trying to achieve certain objectives like hitting an apple or uh, finding the exit of the maze. Uh, as you can see here, if you do self-predictive learning on top of a regular RL baseline, uh, then you can improve pretty significantly. So on the x-axis here, we have 30 games, uh, all of the 30 DM lab uh, games. And on the y-axis, we have uh, like human normalized uh, scores for the improvement. For majority of the games, we see very significant improvement. Although for some games, the rep self-predictive representation learning hurts a little bit. Maybe for these games, uh, it's very difficult to carry out meaningful representation learning, or there's no need for uh, much representation learning because the RL algorithms itself doing policy gradient or TD learning is already doing a pretty good job. Yeah, and this is the last slide for the presentation. Um, so just to have a very high level recap of what we did so far is that we start with um, the fact that the representation learning is pretty critical for supervised learning task and RL. If you do better representation, we have better results for the downstream tasks. And in the current era, we have these end-to-end -end representation learning paradigms. Uh, we have these objectives that we minimize. Um, and it is good to understand what kind of representations we end up with with these objectives. Most of the times, these objectives are motivated more heuristically or from a more intuitive level. But it would be good to understand what kind of representations we get so that we can maybe also design better algorithms. Um, yeah, and finally, basically, in this uh, presentation, we mainly focus on this pretty simple idea of self predictive uh, learning. And basically, the algorithm works pretty well empirically, but there are some theoretical justifications that are missing. Uh, for example, why the algorithm does not collapse, what kind of representations we are learning from the self predictive updates. And in this work, we provide some theoretical insights uh, into these questions. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. And yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions if you have. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Inhao. And it's very, very insightful talk.
Uh, me personally, I heard a little bit about the self-predicting things, but I was always also confused why is it working and uh, also outside of the context of uh, reinforcement learning, there was this works on bio, right, uh, where it's also like... There is some intuition. Uh, by the way, do you know? Do they have any like good theoretical explanation for that performance, as in your case? Yeah. So that's a very good question. So um, basically, all the self-predictive algorithms that you see here for RL, they're kind of motivated or partially borrowed a lot of the components from the bio uh, paper. So the bio was originally designed for supervised, unsupervised learning, um, and in, in there, so it's so the theory, uh, so the research on bio, from what I understand, is mostly empirical. In their original bio paper, they identify, for example, the stop gradient as a very important um, part of the algorithm, and also they also have a predictor, so similar to the latent transition matrix here, and they kind of have ablation that shows that. If you optimize the predictor at a faster pace, you also yield a better performance. Um, but overall, there is uh, there is there are some papers that try to understand the bio paper uh, the bio mechanism better. Um, but the kind of the dynamics, the arguments they have are fairly different from what we have here. Um, so. I think there are a couple of papers from a few years back, two years back, that offer a glimpse into that try to explain why bio works because the bio paper itself originally has many tricks in there. So it has data augmentation, has the target network, has a, a, a stop gradient, of course, in target network, and um, yeah, and a bunch of other tricks. And these papers try to understand what these different tricks impact on the on on the output of the algorithm like why it does not collapse and why it learn anything at all yeah thank you that's uh, that's also interesting yeah we have a question in the chat i will read from mastan knowing the feature dimensionality does your approach recovers the transition kernel for linear mdp um yeah, that's a good point. So uh, let's see. Uh, I have one trivial example. I have not thought about this question uh, too deeply, but as a very trivial example I can have here is, let's say the representation um, phi is fixed and is identity. So we have P transpose X minus Y in this case, and X and Y are one hot vectors. And in this case, we know that P recovers the original transition matrix. So P recover the P pi because the, it turned out that the L2, this has to do with the loss as well. So the L2 happens to recover the mean. So you basically recover the P pi, the original transition matrix. Um, but I'm not sure um, if, for example, if we let the representation to evolve over time, uh, what will happen. So we know that this representation is doing uh, gradient-based SVD or PCA on the transition matrix, and P would evolve accordingly. Um, yeah, I guess in short, I don't have a clear answer to this, um, but it's definitely something worth thinking about because the, we, we know some dynamics on phi and the dynamics on P are derived from the dynamics on phi. So we should be able to make some statements on the dynamics of P as well. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this answer. And probably I have one more question. Uh, I probably was not attentive enough, but the part with a non-symmetric matrix uh, with uh, uh, with um, when you need to do SVD, do you have all the theory like it translates there? Like you have some invariance and everything, or or something changes? Sorry if I missed it from your explanation. Oh, can you repeat the question? Didn't fully get it. 
Yeah, yeah. You, you mentioned, I think, that uh, for non-symmetric transition metrics, uh, you, you need to consider singular value decomposition. And I, I, I didn't get whether your theory fully like uh, translates to that case or, or, or something changes and so on. Um, so, yeah, the results for the, in general, the more asymmetric case is very much of a similar flavor as the symmetry case, but the algorithm needs to change a little bit to adapt to that. Basically, we need to have two representations. Um, mm -hmm. One is a forward representation, one is a backward representation. Okay. And the forward representation, you can think of it as forward representation, try to learn the left singular vector of P pi, and right representation, backward representation, try to learn the right singular vector of P pi. So in general, these two rep these two sets of singular vectors are different, so that's why you need two representations. Um, but we can still show that the the trace objective that defines the singular vector decomposition would increase over time if you do the if you have two representations and if you do a forward prediction and a backward prediction. So here, you see the loss function that we design is more of a forward prediction process. So we start at time t, we predict forward at time t plus one. In that case, we also need to predict backwards. So you want to start with t plus one and look at and find out what previous state has led to that uh, future state. So there needs to be a forward and backward process so that you can do this SVD uh, decomposition more properly. Okay, thank you. That's very interesting. I don't see any more questions from the audience. Probably uh, it was very clear. Uh, well, I think so. And uh, I think we are perfectly on time to finish. And uh, Yunhao, it was a pleasure to have you. And uh, thanks for the wonderful talk and, and see you soon.